Well, good morning. I'm Dave, one of the pastors here, and I'm eager to dive into this passage together today. You know, this winter, we're in a sermon series called Devoted, in which we're learning how to be a church from the very first church described in the Bible. And one of the remarkable features of that brand new church was their remarkable generosity. We just heard that all the believers were together, and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Well, this is even more remarkable because many of these people had just met. As we discussed previously, this church was born when the Holy Spirit arrived and 3,000 people began following Jesus in one day. And remember that this crowd represented so many different languages and countries and cultures and colors and socioeconomic conditions. So these aren't people we naturally expect to get along, but you'll recall from my previous sermon that they devoted themselves to fellowship because they understood that following Jesus involved loving people who are different and when it's difficult. Many of these people came from cultures where becoming a Christian would cost them everything. They'd be rejected by their families and perhaps even threatened with death. We've seen this many times right in our own congregation. When people who've met Jesus here were cut off from their friends or families or home countries because of their new commitment to Jesus. It's devastating. But that's probably what happened to many of those 3,000 new converts in Acts. Some of them suddenly found themselves in need of a, a place to stay or new friends, and the church was there to help. Acts 4 gives a more detailed explanation of the way this worked. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Now, some people have suggested this looks like socialism, but if it were, they wouldn't have sold houses to help people in need because they wouldn't have owned them anymore. And Peter's response in Acts 5 makes it clear that Ananias was not obligated to sell his land and give it to the church. What's amazing is not that these early Christians were communists, but that they were generous. They were so completely converted from trusting money to trusting God that they were freed to give sacrificially to those in need so that there were no needy people among them. Doesn't that sound like the kind of community you'd love to be a part of? Such intimacy and, and, and generosity. I mean, everybody got what they needed. I'd love it if people would sell all they had and give, give me stuff. So, I mean, this sounds great. But I know that the real point is that I want to be so free from bondage to money that I'm able to serve those in need like the first Christians did. So, you can guess where this sermon's going to go. All right, first, I'm going to make you feel guilty about how much you have. Then frighten you with the dangers of money by telling you about lonely lottery winners. And, and then sadden you with stories of suffering and need locally and around the world and inspire you with stories of, of how much good you could do and finally pressure you to give more so that we can be good Christians like the ones in Acts. Actually, that's not what I'm going to do today. Hopefully, they're not that manipulative, but I've preached a lot of sermons on money and generosity over the years, and with good reason, because despite the popular narrative, very few people abandon Christianity for some kind of high-minded atheism. No, the biggest competition for true Christianity today is consumerism. We replace trusting God with trusting money. So you can bet I'm going to preach more sermons about generosity, and this passage seems like the perfect opportunity to do it. But in some sense, I mean, I'd be preaching to the choir because I'm so thankful that High Rock is exceptionally generous. So many times when one member's in need, those who know that person quietly help with money, advice, a place to stay, or just a, a listening ear attached to a, a loving heart. Other times, they don't even know each other, 
but a call goes out when a high rocker is in trouble and volunteers make meals for someone who just had a baby or, or is sick. They, they offer child care so that someone can go to a job interview or a spare room to someone who suffered a house fire or whose heat stopped working in the middle of winter. As Fenny mentioned in his Life Story video a few minutes ago, I got to watch that happen again with his family. Changing work restrictions for international students like him once he was already here have made it almost impossible for his family to survive while he completes his degree. Ironically, now the helper needs help. When high rockers discovered his need due to circumstances beyond their control, people pitched in to help them buy food and donate clothes for their kids and even a computer for school so that he could finish his final semester and return to his wonderful work back in Africa. It's this same spirit that motivated Fenny to begin his ministry in Malawi in the first place. He gave all he could to help others who were in need. You know, all of these examples, as well as the stories and acts, make this seem so simple. Just be generous, and both you and the, the person you're helping will be blessed. But the truth is that it's usually not that simple at all. Because a lot of us don't struggle with whether to be generous, but how to be generous. It's not always easy. Sometimes we're not sure that our help is actually helping. Partially, I'm preaching about this because I've been wrestling with several sticky situations recently and just been unsure what to do. For example, when I see one of my adult kids struggling with a problem, as a dad, I, I want to run in and rescue them. But would that prevent them from learning to take responsibility? As a parent or a friend, could it ever be right not to help someone when I could? Others of you help and help and help. But no matter how much you do, people just keep asking for more, and you're wondering if you're just being an enabler or, or, or being taken advantage of. Something in your gut doesn't feel good about it, but, I mean, of course you want to be generous because you belong to Jesus. Yeah, but is there ever a time when it might be better to stop being so generous? Let me tell you what this looks like in real life. One high rocker asked me for advice because his parents were impoverished, so he'd been sending them money for more than a decade. But it was never enough because his father had a gambling addiction, so he'd immediately lose all the money and come asking for more. Instead of solving the problem through his generosity, my friend was just enabling his father in a way that prevented him from getting the help he really needed. Other times, our generosity ends up robbing the recipients of of dignity and creating debilitating dependencies. I, I know one man who used to be a homeless addict who would beg for money each Sunday outside Park Street Church because he knew that if he could position himself so that those going into church knew that other church members could see them pass him, they'd feel obligated to give money, you know, look like good Christians. But he said that he hated those people who gave him money. They'd offer a whisper, God bless you. Earth. Ooh, Jesus loves you. But he assumed that they knew he was just going to spend the money on more drugs. They didn't love him. They just loved looking good in front of their friends. Today, he takes most of the blame for the years he spent in that cycle, but he claims that those generous church people sure help make it easier to stay stuck there. Even after hearing his story. When, when I pass a homeless person on the subway or the street, my heart is tugged. I want to help. But is giving the money that they're asking for really helpful? Is there a better way? This week, I've been talking with someone who has been a refugee since early childhood, passed around from camp to camp and country to country. And the one constant in his life is that some well-meaning charity has been providing him food and shelter, but restricted him to the camps so, you know, they wouldn't take jobs from the, the, anyone in the host nation. As an adult, he was brought to North America and was suddenly expected to support himself. But he's never learned how to be an employee or, or pay bills or save for the future. He never had to. All, all the help he received saved his life. But by not giving him practice bearing responsibility, now he just feels overwhelmed and 
defeated and says that often he'd just rather die. Did these charities help him or hurt him? Both, I guess. Clearly, it's not that simple. We want to be generous, like the Christians in Acts. But over the past decade, a raft of excellent books, including Toxic Charity and When Helping Hurts, have chronicled the unintentional damage done by our attempts to be generous. These books join many more decrying the ways that we try to help addicts, alcoholics, or even our our own children that do more harm than good by perpetuating the problems we're trying to solve. If this problem of misapplied generosity is so well documented, then why do we keep falling into this trap? Part of it, of course, is that in an age when time is so valuable, sometimes giving money is just the easier thing to do. You know, hear a sad story, you feel like God may be calling you to get involved in a way that might require time or attention. <laughs> Yikes, I can't afford that. Just send some cash and, and so you can move on with your life. Another element of giving money is that it makes us feel powerful, almost godlike, when we believe that we're saving people. Sometimes the person I'm really trying to serve is myself. In a weird way, I'm using the recipient of my charity to assure myself that I'm a good person. These are important considerations, but underlying them all is another question. Is it possible that in addition to reflecting our genuine generosity, some of our attempts to help reveal our deeply ingrained materialism? I know that seems counterintuitive, but consider this. We've all heard the the warnings about the futility of trying to find love and joy, peace, or fulfillment through money. Like I said... You've heard that. Material things can never satisfy what my soul longs for. Right? Only God can do that. But there's another way that we believe in the power of money to do more than it can do. We believe it can solve every problem. There's a refugee crisis in Syria? Let's send the money. A single mom doesn't have a job? Let's send her money. See a beggar? Give him a buck to assuage my conscience and keep walking. You, your parent or, or young adult child is wrestling with hard choices in order to live within their limits, just send some money so they don't have to deal with that for now. It could seem like this is what's going on in Acts. No one had any needs because other people gave them money, and money is always the best way to help. Money is our, our real God. It's the true source of salvation. But that's not what this passage is suggesting. And I know that because between the two stories about this church's financial generosity in Acts chapter 2 and chapter 4 is another important story in Acts 3 that shows us something even better. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. At three in the afternoon, now, a a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. He was paralyzed from birth. And we learn in chapter 4 that he was over 40 years old. Every day he's been dropped at that temple gate to beg. Now, of course, he couldn't actually go into the temple because that culture, disabled people were prohibited from going inside. So every day he sat out there begging for money, hoping that people going in to pray would give him some money. You know know how when you're going to go to the dentist, you, you you know, the day before, you finally start flossing so that when he asked, well, did you floss? You could say, well, of course I floss. <laughs> well, sort of like that. Anyone w- worried that God might not be so happy to see them at temple that day can try to score some last-second bonus points with God by tossing a few coins to someone in need. If you live or work in the city, you come to recognize certain homeless people along your regular beat. You know, driving past Alewife, walking in Harvard Square, coming up the stairs from the subway. You you recognize the same faces day after day, and that's how this paralyzed man was. A familiar face begging in the same place every day for decades. And like every other day, 
he asks passers-by for money. I mean, he was probably accustomed to being ignored or appeased with a few coins, but Peter did something different. Peter looked straight at him. And he said something surprising. Silver or gold I do not have. Now, that may have been true, but Peter knew how to get money easily. I mean, we just read that those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. So Peter could have gotten the beggar some cash, but he chose to give him something better. You know, if Peter tossed him a few coins, Peter might have felt pretty good about himself and, and looked good in front of others. And, and the beggar could have gotten a little food or maybe a drink and then been right back at that exact same spot like he had been for the past 40 years so they could repeat this same sad cycle for the next 40 years. But Peter stopped and paid attention long enough to realize that he needed more than just money. So he said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, of Nazareth, walk. Most of us can't do that as easily as Peter does. But God can still use us to heal people. There's a danger as we read this story that we think it's about healing a man's legs, but that's not actually the point of the story. The point of the story is what happened next. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. You see, this guy had been at the temple gate for decades, but he'd never been allowed inside. But now he was able to join that vibrant, generous Christian community that was devoted to helping each other that we read about back in Acts chapter 2. Unlike the help that we sometimes offer that makes people more dependent on us for survival, the way Peter helped was to give this man the ability to engage in community, support himself, and have something to share with others. Thoughtful charity organizations call this building capacity. Instead of simply perpetuating a bad situation, they give needy people the tools and networks they need to change the situation. Like the old saying, it's you know, better to teach a person to fish than simply give them a fish day after day. High Rock gives almost $85,000 per year to support poverty relief in Congo. But I appreciate that this is not just a bunch of Westerners coming in to offer daily food distribution, which creates dependencies and doesn't change anything for the long run. Instead, this whole program is being led by the local Congolese. After decades of oppression, we're helping them rediscover their own ability to lead and create effective solutions to their own problems so they won't need us anymore. And along the way, we partner with them so that they can offer every child education and vaccines. They can teach adults sustainable farming and trades. They're even planting forests hundreds of miles away that create more rainfall and make previous unusable land suitable for farming. The goal of those local leaders is that within 15 years, this region will not only be self-sustaining, but will actually be a net exporter of produce. That takes a lot more time and effort than just sending a check. But it makes a change that can be transformational. This is the same thing Fenny is doing in Malawi. Yes, he feeds a, a thousand hungry children each day, but he's also educating them so that they can earn a living for themselves and have something to share with others. Last year, high rocker Jean Sicarella was so troubled by the migrants stranded and suffering at our southern border that she knew she had to do something. But like Peter, she stopped long enough to look and listen and find out what was needed most. In response, she's partnering with Christians living there to start Misión de Caridad. When she first told me about her dream to build housing for them, I, I pointed out she could never afford to build enough apartments for all those people. But that's not what they're doing. They're building apartments so that people can be safe and settled enough to receive other services, including giving people trauma counseling, a, a new community, and some job skills. The goal is to equip these people to move back out within three months into a sustainable life where they don't need to depend on charity from others. They're building capacity. The Apostle Paul recognized this as an important part of healing people. He wrote that Christians who were able must work doing something useful with their hands so that they have something to share with those in need. Well, 
what does all this mean for us? It means that we must help people in need, including those in poverty around the world or in pain right next door. But sometimes just tossing money at a problem only makes the problem worse. Several times a week, strangers contact our church asking for money. Some of them are scam artists who make their rounds periodically, but most of the needs are legitimate. Someone just got laid off or their child got sick and they can't afford the exorbitant hospital bills. As happens every week, I got an email on Friday from a woman here in Arlington asking for our church to start paying her rent because she just can't afford it anymore. We love to help people, but there's a reason we're called a non-profit. We're the one company in town that doesn't even try to make money, and we succeed every single year. (laughs) As much as we'd like to, we can't pay the mortgages of all the people who need it. That much silver and gold, we don't have. But that doesn't mean we don't have something valuable to share. What we do have is a community devoted to following Jesus and helping each other. We have realtors who could help her explore less expensive rentals, financial advisors who could help her make the best decisions, and lots of people could walk with her through this difficult season. Our goal is to ensure she doesn't face this same struggle the next month, and the next, constantly requiring ever more charity, but never changing the situation. The beggar was excluded from that community due to his disability and discrimination in that society. So Peter healed him in order to overcome that barrier. But that wasn't the end of the healing. That was just the beginning. Because then Peter invited him into the church where he met other followers of Jesus who loved him, so they would gladly have sacrificed, maybe even sold their homes in order to meet his needs. But they would have understood his situation well enough to discern what he truly needed. Like maybe a new job. A community like that is much better than a few coins. High Rock's neighbor to neighbor team does this. They get to know neighbors in need. They look and listen long enough to understand what the real problem is and then find resources in God and in our community to address it so those people won't be in need anymore. However, whether it be about fighting poverty, figuring out how to parent, or just respond to some other need that I see, sometimes we offer the wrong kind of help because we fail to distinguish between crisis moments and chronic needs. So we rush in to offer relief when rehabilitation, discipleship, or development is what they really need. So when there's a crisis, like an earthquake in Puerto Rico, maybe the best thing we can do in that moment is send money. After the hurricane in Puerto Rico, our family changed our vacation plans to partner with a local church to help people get food and clear debris out of their yards. But when there's a chronic need, like that created by decades of government corruption in Puerto Rico, giving more money just perpetuates the problem. Likewise, if one of my adult kids needed help covering rent, because they got hurt in a car accident, used up all their savings, and and made them miss two weeks of work, sending money might be appropriate. But if they need help paying their rent every month because they wanted to live in a really trendy neighborhood and then they spent all of their money on the newest iPhone, it probably means that they need to find a better job or a cheaper apartment or a little self-restraint. Sending them money will only perpetuate that problem. The person who makes choices is the one who should bear the consequences. If I keep letting them make the same bad choices, but I bear the consequences by paying the cost, they're never going to feel the discomfort that could enable them to grow. Now, I realize that when you're dealing with somebody with a chronic problem, whether it's substance abuse or financial difficulties or relational tensions, it can seem like there's a crisis almost every day. But rather than cure the crisis du jour, I need to slow down long enough to ask, God, what does love look like in this situation? Am am I helping them get out of a bad situation for good, or am I helping them stay stuck in a bad situation that's going to keep them dependent on continued help? (coughs) Is there a better intervention that might address the underlying problem rather than continuing this exhausting game of whack-a-mole in which a new crisis pops up almost as soon as the last one gets better? As a dad and a pastor, 
I'm a person. I, I struggle with that. The godly response seems to be bringing relief to anyone experiencing pain as quickly as possible. But maybe that's not as godly as I think it is. Because sometimes God waits and lets us wrestle with the problem long enough to feel the discomfort of it, bear the weight. Sometimes that's the best way to learn and grow. Robert Lupton, the author of Toxic Charity, writes, quote, the only effective charity is the kind that asks more from those being served rather than less. Asking for more sends the affirming message to the recipient that he or she also has something of value to offer. Giving people in need what, could be, what they could be gaining from their own initiative may well be the kindest way to destroy them, end quote. What this means is that whether it be charity work in Haiti or helping a homeless person or dealing with a relative with an addiction or, or parenting my own kids, when the problem is a chronic one rather than a crisis, I may need to increase my tolerance for their discomfort without rushing in anxiously to rescue them right away. Helping people address the deeper problems may not be the kind of help they really want from you. Growing is uncomfortable. So most of us try to avoid it. So they may get angry if you refuse to fix the immediate problem by giving them money or whatever they want and claim that you're not very godly or loving. But people in a toxic cycle need others who love enough to not give them what they want so that they can feel the pain that incentivizes them to finally escape that cycle. People get angry at God all the time if He doesn't give them what they want. But God gives them what we need in order to grow, find freedom and fullness of life. God is the most generous, but loves us enough to not always give us what we ask for. As I've been wrestling with how to love more like God does in these sticky situations, I've come up with four simple steps that have been helpful for me and I hope may be helpful for you. The first is to begin by worshiping God. Money may seem like the most powerful thing in the world until we meditate on the one who created the world. God does not need you. God does not need your money. God could solve all the problems in the world without us, but offers us the dignity and intimacy of participating in bringing salvation to the world, including by sharing with others whatever God has shared with us. This is part of his gift to us, that we're not only invited to join his family, we get to join the family business by, by serving others the way that God does. So don't try to replace God by rescuing people. Instead, trust that God cares for them even more than you do. Ask what God's doing already and whether there's a part you have to play in his ministry to the, his child that he loves very much. Secondly, give what you can God's given some of you silver and gold to share. Others of you don't have that. But you can serve in other ways that may be even more meaningful in certain situations. Visit the sick. Deliver dinner. Invite them to coffee. Offer babysitting, prayer, or write encouraging notes. There's a woman who's been praying for me every single day since before I even became a Christian. Right? What a gift she is to me. All of us have something good to offer. Even those who think of ourselves as being the ones in need. Discovering our ability to bless others can be an important part of our own growth and maturity. So each of us should ask, what do I have to share with others? Uh, an extra bedroom? Free time? Expertise in some field? Networks or connections? The ability to fix things? What can I give that someone else might need? From time to time, Michelle and I have invited people in crisis situations to live with us for a short time. It gives them stability, financial relief, and the community they need to get back on their feet. Maybe you could do that. Or foster a child. Or, or visit someone who's elderly. Or write a big check. In some situations, that's a great gift. We just want to look long enough to make sure that that's the most helpful. A few minutes ago, I mentioned that Jean had started Mission de Caridad in order to help migrants at the border. Well, not everybody can do that. But 
a bunch of high rockers wanted to do what they can. And so realized what they can do well is cook and decorate and host. So a group of about 20 high rockers are hosting a benefit dinner here on March 28th to raise money for Misión de Caridad. Well, maybe you can't even cook very well, but you can eat. So perhaps you could help by buying tickets and enjoying a great meal. <laughs> if you're the leader of a company, another practical way you may be able to help is by creating jobs that people can be proud of and are going to provide for them. What if your goal were not simply to maximize profits, but to maximize creating good jobs? People are created to work. We want to work. That's part of what it means to be made in God's image. Charity that keeps people from working is not a gift to them. It is a curse. Others of you aren't in a position to offer jobs, but that doesn't mean you can't help. Offer your business acumen to help someone gain new skills or, or get hired. Instead of giving them money, give them the ability to earn money, which brings with it dignity. Third, once you identify some gifts that you could share, be generous, but cautious. Find out what's really needed rather than just rushing in with the solution you want to give. It would have been much faster for Peter to toss a few coins at the beggar and keep on going, but he stopped to look at him, see what he really needed, and then give him the ability to participate in community in a healthy way. Now, I've really struggled with this now that some of my kids are out on their own. I, I see them wrestling with the challenges of adulting and living within their very limited means, and as a dad, I want to relieve them of the, the painful process of learning how to manage money and, and life, but by doing that, I might be harming them more than I'm helping. Some of you know the, the story of the man who happened upon a, a chrysalis, you know, also known as a cocoon, from, from which a butterfly was struggling to escape. For several minutes, the, the butterfly would work feverishly and, and to make a hole large enough to squeeze through and then collapse back inside, exhausted. Filled with compassion, the man decided to help by taking his pocket knife and gently cutting a small hole in the chrysalis, big enough for the, the butterfly. Soon the butterfly emerged, but instead of flying off majestically, the insect with shriveled wings and a bloated body stumbled out and unable to fly soon died. The man didn't understand that it's the hardship of escaping the cocoon that ultimately saves the butterfly by forcing it to develop strength. And squeezing through that small hole wrings all the extra fluid out of the, the butterfly's body and it flates its wings so that it can fly. Good intentions are not good enough. Now, I realize that sometimes my impulse to rush in and rescue people is actually what keeps them from growing into what God created them to be. Sometimes hardship can be ways that God's way to heal us or point us in a new, better direction that we weren't willing to consider before. Unlike, or until the, the, the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of changing, most of us are going to choose to stay stuck. But it can be very hard to watch somebody that you care about experience that pain. So ask before you intervene, am I really helping that other person or myself by making myself feel powerful or virtuous or relieved of worrying about them? Is what I want truly good for them or does it just feel good for me? Sometimes they need more money, but other times they need more dignity counseling, moral support, or responsibility? What would it look like if we did more relational work and not just relief work? Either way, the call is for us to be generous, just like the, the church that we read about in Acts, but not just with money, with love and attention and wisdom and prayer and encouragement and advice. All of us have something to give. Some of you have more money to share, others more time, others other kind of gifts, and they can all be valuable and may be exactly what somebody needs so that God can bless them through you. The key is to struggle with how to be generous, not whether to be generous, which leads to my final point. Do something. All the good intentions in the world are meaningless if you don't actually get involved somewhere. Serving others is a part of what it means to follow Jesus. 
join the Chang family who's raising money for a medical van for our church partners in India, or, or join the team of medical professionals who are going to India this summer to, to work alongside doctors in, from the Indian churches as they care for underserved people who may be seeing the love of Christ lived out for the very first time. Or maybe you were moved by the ministry that Finney leads, uh, we learned about in today's video. Perhaps God is going to call you to support his family for their final semester while they're studying, or, or support his ministry back in Malawi. Love in Action is meeting crisis and chronic needs. Now, he's going to be downstairs, hopefully, after the service. He'd love to tell you more. I say I hopefully because I'm not sure he's going to be able to get here today. He doesn't have the money for gas. If you feel burdened to help homeless people, instead of just tossing them a buck, perhaps you could volunteer at a homeless shelter or like Bosque Rescue Mission that, that can truly heal people or donate to a local food pantry. Or maybe God's going to call you to something else. But whatever it is, do something. Following Jesus means generously sacrificing for the sake of others. Oh, but, but what if I get cheated? That, that question always comes up. We want to be as wise as possible. But if you're not taken advantage of or, or are a bit excessive in, in your giving, at least occasionally, then you probably don't share the heart of Christ. Friends, I believe that Jesus can change people, heal people, help them discover the gifts that God has given them. And Jesus usually does that by inviting them into Christian communities that care for each other. The reality that even those of us with sufficient income and able bodies still need help. The paralytic wanted silver or gold, but God had something much more in mind. You may want comfort this week. Or, or the strength to make it through one more day facing the same old struggles, but God may want something more for you. Perhaps He wants to free you from whatever's keeping you stuck. Maybe it's a, a physical ailment, or maybe it's an attitude. Maybe it's your selfishness or stubbornness or some other sin. Maybe it's a broken relationship or a relationship in which you're enabling someone else stay stuck by your misguided generosity. Maybe it's your low expectations for what God can do. Maybe it's shame over your past. Maybe it's fear that prevents you from boldly following Jesus or stops you from being generous with others in need. Whatever it is, our God saves. He saves poor people and rich people, and He can save you. Like He saved Peter and the paralyzed man in our story. And He can save others through you. Like He did through Peter and through the paralyzed man in our story. As we take a few minutes in prayer now, just let me give you a chance to talk to God by yourself and ask how the Lord may be wanting to save you today or how he may want to be saving others through you. Let's take some time, bring those questions to God, and then Pastor Eugene will lead us in response in a few minutes.